us through the course of the month, you know that we have been in a series about the church, and the series is titled, Who Are We? Who Are We? Who Are We as the Church? Well, today's message is the final one in our study, and it's titled, Loved by Jesus. The Church is Loved by Jesus. Now, the Bible uses a couple of metaphors for the church. One of those is the body of Christ, and the other is the bride of Christ. Last week we looked at the body and what that means to be the body of Christ. And we saw that the body is made up of many parts. All of the parts are different, but they're all important. And God has put them together exactly the way he wants them to be. Uh, That came from 1 Corinthians. And what that means is that the church, if you were to kind of paraphrase this, the church is a community of people who are following Christ. We're all different because God made us that way. And that's how he wants us to be. He put us all together because that's how it works best. And why is that? Well, because God is growing the church to be a community of people who are becoming like Jesus. God is growing the church to be a community of people who are coming to be like Jesus. That means thinking like him, acting like him, serving like him, and carrying out his work in the world. We're to have unity with one another because we're all part of the same body. We're all part of the body of Christ. But there is diversity in that body. Through the diversity, however, there should be unity. Well, what we'll be looking at today is the concept of the church being the bride of Christ. That second metaphor that we talked about, the church as the bride of Christ. Now, this is found in several places in the New Testament writings, one of which is the book of Ephesians, and we'll be spending our time there this morning as we look at this idea of the church being the bride of Christ. So, if you'd like to turn there, uh, we can do that. Uh, The book of Ephesians is one of Paul's letters, and it's written to the church in Ephesus. Well, as we begin, though, I'd like for us to pray together. God, thank you for who you are. Thank you that you love us. Thank you for showing us your love by making us, by caring for us, by giving us your word, and by sending the Son into the world. Thank you that in these things you show us what it means to love. As we seek to return your love, through worship and the study of your word. Please help us to be focused on you. Please help us to commit our hearts and our minds to you and to give ourselves over to the Holy Spirit who teaches us, who leads us, and who guides us into the truth. Mm. We pray that all we do would be in love and unity, that it would be pleasing and glorifying to you. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. 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 All right, well, as I mentioned this morning, we'll be in the book of Ephesians. Uh, Again, that's one of Paul's letters, and it's a letter that he has written to the church in a place called Ephesus. And, you know, Paul was writing most of his letters uh, around the time period of about uh, 45 to 60 AD, somewhere in that range. Uh, So all of his letters are written to the early church, right? Christian communities that have recently become Christian communities. And so they're relatively young churches and they're having to come to terms with what it means to not only be a Christian, what it means to follow Christ, but they're having to come to terms with how that works as a group of people doing this all together. And a group of people who are not only doing it together, but who are surrounded by the culture and the people out of which they came, right? So life was different. Life uh, is different now in the church. And they've got to figure these things out. So Paul writes his letters many times to say, I understand the concerns that you have. I understand the struggles that you're going through. I understand your questions. And here are some of the answers And here are also some of the ways to think about it. 
that will help guide you to the answers. So when Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus, he's mainly discussing unity in Christ. What it means that because of what Christ has done, we as believers, we as members of that one body, should be in unity with one another. Paul is writing about how this works down to the fundamental relationships of our lives, which is a way that Paul often likes to bring things out of the theoretical and down into the reality, the reality of life. is to say, okay, well, you understand these things on a high level. Uh, now let's take a look at where the, where the rubber really meets the road. How does that work in your life? And how does it work really in your primary relationships? Okay? So those primary relationships that Paul likes to talk about are marriage and family life. He likes to talk about work uh, and uh, what it means to be a worker and what it means to be a manager or a supervisor. And he likes to talk about uh, what it means to be a friend. Right? So it's into this idea of we understand that we're supposed to have unity because of what Christ has done. And Paul is making that transition into uh, how that works in your life. That at this stage of the letter where we're going to begin reading, Paul brings in uh, the imagery of the body of Christ. And he also expands that into the imagery of a marriage. He talks about the relationship of husband and wife as well as the picture of a bride and groom as a way of describing what the church should be like. So let's turn to chapter 5 in the book of Ephesians. And we're going to read verses 22 through 32. And we'll see how Paul brings these two images, both the body of Christ and the image of a marriage, to bear on what it means to be the church. So if we begin reading in chapter 5... With verse 22, Paul says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife also, as Christ is head of the church. He is the Savior of the body. Now as the church submits to Christ, so wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as also Christ loved the church and gave himself for her to make her holy, cleansing her in the washing of water by the word. He did this to present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hates his own flesh, but provides and cares for it just as Christ does for the church since we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This mystery is profound, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. Well, who, who's heard teaching on this passage before that mainly focused on the relationship between husband and wife? Right? Mm -hmm. I have. Uh, I've always heard it taught wives be submissive to your husbands, and husbands love your wives. Husbands be worthy of your wife's respect because she can submit to you if you're living a life like Christ. And that's a lot of what is going on here. But there's also a little bit more to it. Right? So the first question that we'll be asking this morning and we'll also be answering is this. Why is marriage Christ's relationship to the church? Why is marriage Christ's relationship to the church? Specifically, why does Paul choose this image of a husband and wife or of a bride and a groom to talk about Christ's relationship to the church? Well, the Bible is full of of this kind of imagery. 
The Bible is full of wedding and marriage imagery to describe God's relationship to his people. If we would go back to the Old Testament or the Hebrew Scriptures, we would see that Israel is often identified as uh, like a spouse to God, that God is the faithful husband, and the nation of Israel or the Hebrew people are the unfaithful spouse, the unfaithful wife. And there's this tension in the relationship back and forth where God is always doing what is good. He's always doing what is right for his people. And the people are sometimes faithful and sometimes not faithful. And one of the uh, primary examples that we see of this is the story of Hosea, one of the prophets. Uh, If you guys remember this story... Hosea is a man of God, he's a prophet, and he's told to go and find a wife, but the wife he's told to find and marry is Gomer, and Gomer is a prostitute. And through this story, we see that continually Hosea is told, take her back, take her back, take her back, no matter what she does, take her back. And she continually is unfaithful to Hosea. And this is a picture that God gives us for his relationship to the nation of Israel, Hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So we see originally that this imagery of marriage for uh, God's relationship to his people is one that's used for the nation of Israel with respect to God, and it's a, a tumultuous, it's a tenuous relationship. It's one where he is always good and faithful, but the people are not. Well, the Bible also uses the imagery of a bride and groom to describe Jesus' relationship to the church. Uh, We see that here in Ephesians, where we've just read. But also, Revelation 21 is another place where we get this idea of the church as the bride of Christ. And what we're told there is that the church is like a bride adorned for her husband that she is the wife of the Lamb. And the song we sang this morning talks about that. Like a bride waiting for her groom, we'll be a church ready for you. Well, how is the church going to be ready for Christ? How is the church going to be a bride adorned for her wedding? And it's because of what Christ himself has done. And we see this in Paul's letter to the Ephesians where he talks about Uh, Christ has given himself for the church, and by doing so, uh, he's putting her through a process of becoming cleansed, of becoming clean, so that she can be presented on that final day without wrinkle, without spot, without blemish, a bride who is ready for her groom. And Jesus himself often used the imagery of a wedding when he talked about the kingdom of heaven, and what it would be like at his return. So, you know, you've got the story that Jesus tells of the wedding banquet. Maybe some of you are familiar with this. There is uh, a wedding banquet that's to be held, and all of the guests are invited, but none of them show up, right? And the father is upset about this. And so immediately he says to his servants, go out in the street, get everyone who you can, everyone who will come and bring them in to the banquet. And so the guests who are supposed to be there aren't there, but everyone who's willing to come is there for the banquet. And Jesus talks about this as a model for the kingdom of heaven, what the kingdom of heaven will be like. Well, it'll be like a wedding banquet where the people who were supposed to be there are not there, but everyone who would come, they're all brought in. And you know, all of those who would come were the people who were not on the guest list. And one of the reasons they were not on the guest list is because they were not the guests of honor, so to speak. They were the people in the street, the people who were on the fringes of society, the people who would not be invited to a banquet. They're all the ones who are included in the kingdom. They are all the ones who the Father brings in. Well, we also have the story that Jesus tells of a bridal party who has to wait because the groom is delayed. You may uh, be familiar with the story of the virgins who are trimming their wicks, right? 
And so you've got in the bridal party the, uh, the group of women who are attendants to the bride, and they're ready. They know that the groom is delayed. They say, okay, well, we're going to turn down our lamps, and we're going to save our oil, and we're going to be ready for when the groom comes. And then you have the other part of that, uh, those bridal attendants, who don't think that way. And they allow their, uh, they allow their lamps to burn. They fall asleep. And when they wake up, when they hear that the groom is coming, they're not ready. They have, their lamps are not ready. They have no oil. They have to go buy the oil. And so they miss out because they are not ready when the groom returns or when the groom comes. Well, then to answer our question that we've been asking, uh, first off, why is marriage Christ's relationship to the church? We could give this answer. <clears throat> marriage is the union of husband and wife. Marriage is the union of husband and wife. Just as husband and wife are joined together, and Paul quotes from the Old Testament, the two will become one flesh, so the church is to be joined with Christ. The church is to be joined with Christ the same way that a groom is to be joined with his bride so that the man and the woman will be in unity together, will become one flesh. Well, this leads us to our next question that we're going to ask. <clears throat> what does the Bible say about marriage? If we're to understand Christ's relationship to the church as the relationship between a bride and a groom, as a marriage relationship, then what does the Bible tell us about marriage? How do we understand that idea based on what the Bible says? <clears throat> Well, if we look at the biblical concept of marriage, we see that the husband and wife are created for each other. If you go back to the story in Genesis, where we see that God formed Adam, the man, out of the dust of the earth, right? He said to him almost immediately, it's not good for the man to be alone, so I'm going to make you a suitable helper. And that suitable helper is somebody who is made not only exactly for him, but is taken out of him, right? So we go, we go on through the story to find that Adam is put into a deep sleep. And while he's in a deep sleep, a rib is removed from his body. And when that rib is removed from his body, Eve or the woman is formed around that rib. And when she's presented to Adam, what does he do? He says, oh my gosh, this is great. Wow, now this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. This is somebody who is made exactly for me. And then we go on to have uh, the quote that Paul has made here in Ephesians that we read actually comes from the Genesis story that says, For this reason, a man will leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. And that's exactly what Paul quotes in Ephesians when he's talking about this relationship of marriage for Christ and the church. The two will become one flesh. Well, what does that really mean? <clears throat> well, the wife is taken from the groom. They belong together. The woman is perfectly suited to the man. The church is supposed to be perfectly suited to Christ. <clears throat> and they should return to being one flesh. They should be together in perfect unity. And we also see that marriage is the highest priority relationship for human beings next to their relationship with God. Right? Um, by a show of hands, how many of us in here are in perfect unity with our spouses? Mark's laughing. You don't, have a spouse? you don't have one, so you can be in perfect unity with your your spouse that you don't have. Yeah, none of us have perfect relationships, do we? We don't have perfect marriages. We uh, do. <clears throat> my wife and I don't have a perfect marriage, but we both share a perfect Savior. Amen. Right? And it's because we both share a perfect Savior and we have uh, 
God is a priority in our relationship, that the two of us are in unity on many of the things uh, that are important for our combined life. This is the um, this is the imagery that we have for the church as well, in the sense that the church is not full of perfect people, right? But the church has a perfect Savior. And because the church has a perfect Savior, and the church is supposed to have this perfect Savior as the highest priority in its life, right? So the church's highest priority is its relationship to God, and the people of the church's highest priority next to their relationship to God is their relationship with one another. And we're all focused on the mission that Christ has given the church. We're focused on the mission of God in the world. We can be in unity around that, despite all of our differences, despite all of our diversity, because we have a perfect Savior and we share a common mission, a common priority, we can have unity. And through the work that this perfect Savior is doing in the life of the church, we are being changed. We're being changed daily to become more like him. And this is preparing us for the wedding day. This is preparing the church for the wedding day. So this leads us then into our final question that we're asking this morning, which is this. How does Jesus love the church? If we understand that within marriage there should be love, and we're told through what we read in Ephesians that Jesus loves the church, then how does Jesus love the church? What is this idea of love that's being talked about here? What does it mean that husbands should love their wives in the same way that Jesus loves the church? Well, one thing that's important to understand is that God has a special love for the church. God has a special love in general. When the Bible talks about God's love, uh, particularly in the New Testament, the word that's used is a Greek word, agape. And agape is a different word than is typically used in connection with the love that people have for one another. That word is phileo. Phileo means a brotherly love or a sisterly love. And agape means a divine love, a love that humans do not possess. It's a love that we can exercise. If we are in Christ, we can love in the way that he loves. But it's not something that we have on our own. Now, when I say that God has a special love for the church, what I mean is that God loves the church above all else. There is nothing more that God loves than the church. Well, you may say, well, how do you know that, Errol? Does the Bible say that? the answer is yes. Yes, it does. As we read in Ephesians, Jesus showed his love for the church by dying for her. The church is what Jesus died for. Jesus himself said, there is no greater love than to lay down one's life for his friends. And we know that the disciples were Jesus' friends. There was a Sunday school class I was in some time ago And there was a really helpful little description that was given for the disciples. Uh, They were called Jesus' helper friends. Jesus' helper friends. I thought, well, that's an interesting way to take the concept of the disciples and explain it to uh, kids who are second to fifth grade. Well, Jesus often called the disciples his friends, particularly toward the end, uh, before he returned to the Father. And in the context of that, he was saying, there is no greater love than to lay down your life for your friends. And so, Jesus laid down his life for the disciples. The disciples were those whom he had formed into the early church, and the disciples went out 
to form all of the uh, successive churches that would come into existence. So Jesus has laid down his life for the church, and that's what Paul tells us here in this letter to the Ephesians. When he says, Jesus loved the church and he gave himself for her to make her holy. He did this to present her to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but holy and blameless. So, one of the questions might be, well, why would Jesus do this? Why would he give his life for the church? And the answer is because she's his bride. Because the two are to become one flesh. And part of the work that Jesus was doing was to make it possible for humans to be in relationship with God again. And for humans to be in relationship with God, for humans to exist in the same space as God, we have to be holy. But we are not holy because we have sin. Because we have chosen from the very beginning, as we're told in the Garden of Eden, to go our own way instead of God's way. So we went over here after what we wanted, what we thought was good, and didn't stay over here with what God told us was good. And this made us unholy. It made it so that we could not exist in the same space with God, which is why Adam and Eve had to be put outside of the garden. Well, in order for uh, sinful humanity to come back into a place where we can exist with a holy God, God himself has to do the work to make us holy, which is why Jesus came into the world, which is why Jesus died on the cross, which is why he gave his life for his friends. And those friends are the church, and the church is what will be reunited with him on that day of his return. So the church is to come into union with Christ on the day of his return in the same way that a husband and wife are to come into union with one another on the day of their marriage. The two will become one flesh. But for the church to become to come into union with her perfect Savior, the church must be pure and clean, or she must be purified and cleansed. So the answer to this question, the answer to How did Jesus do this? How did he show his love? What does it really mean that Jesus loves the church? Is this. He gave himself for it. He gave his life. He put what was right for the church above himself. Jesus showed a love which is sacrificial. He showed a love which prioritizes the church above himself. We are the ones who needed to be saved. God put our need for salvation above his own needs. So God shows us that love is an action. It means doing something. We've talked about before how you know, as 20th and 21st century Americans, we typically have a concept of love that's given to us through uh, our upbringing, uh, through what our, our parents teach us, through what our friends and our relationships teach us, through what television and movies and uh, whatever else kind of puts out there for a concept of love. And if you're like me, <clears throat> Uh, you probably got a lot of your ideas about love from movies while you were growing up. And it was all about romantic uh, things. Like, uh, you know, if you love uh, your girlfriend or your wife, then you're going to bring her flowers, or you're going to bring her candy, or you're going to uh, take her to a nice dinner. You might plan a trip. You know, you're going to show your love in these ways. Well, <clears throat> that idea of romantic love and those ways of showing romantic love are only a small part of the biblical concept of love. Because in the Bible, when love is what's talked about, uh, there's a little more to it than candy and flowers, right? 
there's a little more to it than just the emotional aspect, the, the nice feeling that you have towards somebody. Uh, the Bible talks about love in terms of friendship, in terms of uh, loyalty, and in terms of doing what is right for someone else, even if it costs you, even if it's actually not good for you. So, God shows us that love, that His love, is characterized by sacrifice. It's shown in doing what's right for others, even when there's a cost to yourself. It's a love which seeks good, rather than seeking the individual's benefit. It's a divine love, a love that we don't possess unless we are in Christ. A love that we could not comprehend or uh, actually execute if we had not seen God do it. If we hadn't seen Him send the Son into the world and die on the cross for our benefit rather than for His own. So what does it mean for us? Uh, what does this mean for us? What does it mean uh, for the church? to have this kind of a love in view, uh, to know that this is how God loves, uh, and it's different from how we as humans typically love. Well, what it means is this. Uh, this will be our final thought for today. The church is a community loving like Jesus loves. This is the ideal for the church. This is where the church will be on that day of Christ's return. It's not where we are right now. Right? We're on a path to getting there. Um, that path involves a lot of change as we're made individually and as a group to be more and more like Jesus through the events of our lives. But this is where we're going. This is where the church is being brought this is the process of being made clean, being made holy, being made into the bride who can be presented to the groom without wrinkle, without spot, without blemish. We will be a community of people who are following Christ, and in following Christ, we are loving in the way Jesus loves. And on that day, the work will be complete to where our love can be exactly the kind of love that he's shown. You see, the, uh, the husband and wife are to become one flesh. That's where we're going as a church. We're to become one flesh because we are one flesh. Human beings were made in the image of God. Human beings were made to be the representatives of God in this world. Uh, the original language in Hebrew, if you would read Genesis, where it says, uh, where God says, let us make man in our image, that word image is actually the Hebrew word for idol, salem. Salem means the same thing as when you carve something out of wood and you set it up and you say, okay, this represents God. Well, God turns that idea around at the very beginning, and he says, look, I've made something, and the something I've made is supposed to represent me. Human beings, when we are operating exactly the way that God has made us to operate, we are operating in a way that is in line with God's nature, in line with God's character, so that God can be seen through us. When God the Son came into the world as Jesus Christ, he's the perfect representation, the perfect image, the perfect salem of God, right? Because he is God. And he is God together completely with humanity in a way that we can see how we were supposed to be and what we are to become, right? And that's exactly what the church is supposed to be on that day when we are raised in Christ. We, the work is complete. 
we are made to be exactly the way we're supposed to be. We are the perfect image, the perfect representation of God. <clears throat> well, what we see in this idea of love is that God has shown us the way we are supposed to love, the way the church is supposed to love. He's shown us that through God the Son coming into the world to live our life and to do it in a way that we can see exactly what it should look like if we were doing it the way God wants. He laid down that life, showing us his love, showing us God's love. And he did it to free us from this bondage to our own ways that we've put ourselves into, or our first parents have put us into, Adam and Eve. Those ways which keep us from God, which keep us from being the bride who's ready. So if we've been cleansed, if we've been purified, if we know who God has made us to be as the church, we have to ask ourselves, are we living that way? Are we on that path where we are becoming the bride who is clean, the bride who is pure, the bride who is without wrinkle, without spot, without blemish, who is ready on that day? Are we changing each day to become that church? The church who knows it's an object of God's love. The church who loves its own body and cares for all of its members. The husband who loves his wife as himself. The wife who supports her husband as he tries to follow Christ. The parent who cares for their children and doesn't exasperate them. The church who shows God's love to the surrounding community and invites them in. Are we that church? Are we on the path to being that church? Let's pray. Lord, as we consider your love and what it means for us as a church to be loving as you are loving, please show us the real ways we can practice your love in our daily lives. As we're getting ready to move to communion, remind us of the reality of of your body and your blood, the reality of the life <clears throat> that you took up and that you laid down, not for yourself, but for us, so that we could be the church you've made us to be, so that we can be the church who's ready for you. Help us to be that church, to be a community of your followers, living and acting in the ways you've shown us, loving in the ways you've shown us. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen.